Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask that your word be as a lamp onto our feet. Amen. It's not always and not in every generation that we can say that everybody sees the world in the same way. But today, we can say nobody is happy with the way things are in our world right now. The whole world is caught up in a desperate and a frantic hope. Everyone is hoping that things will be different. Hoping that the terrible rise in the Omicron variant will decrease and disappear. Hoping that the pandemic will end. Hoping that we will not get sick. Hoping that we will be able to travel, visit friends and family. Hoping to get back to the office that our school life will be more normal. Hoping to find work, to have security for the future. Hoping. Hoping that the war in Ukraine will end and not expand. Hoping there will be no more firing of missiles in the Korean Peninsula. The world seems to be in a mess of global proportions. Much of what we had hoped for five years ago seems destroyed, ruined, or at least under threat. Everybody is hoping, hoping urgently to move on. Mostly, we are hoping to get back to normal return to how things were before. The problem is that last hope, the return to normal, is a tricky one. Because even in our desperation, we remember two years ago. And we remember that normal was not good for most people in this planet. It was not good for the Earth and not good for ourselves. Normal meant a life-threatening climate crisis. Normal meant unbearable poverty and inequality. Normal meant rising racism and authoritarian governments, lack of respect for human rights. On top of it all, normal meant that the generation coming up, Gen Z or Gen Z, found themselves depressed and disillusioned because even after doing everything they had been told to do, all the sacrifices, all the studies, all the dedication to the things they were supposed to do by following the script, things did not work out well for them. So this urgency that above all else, we have to move from wherever we are and get back to normal. Re and this reminds me of a story from my country, Canada, where a traveler was in the very large farmlands in Canada. Huge amounts of fields and trees and plants and was totally lost. Finally, after traveling and traveling, desperate to get to his desperation, the man saw a farmer. And he went up to him and said, I have to get immediately to Regina, the name of a big city. And the farmer thought about it, looked puzzled, and then finally said, if I was going there, I wouldn't start from here. And that dilemma of to understand what we desperately are hoping to do and where we want to go, 
that we're not in a good spot to get there. We are not starting at the right place. And that is the news of our text today. That what the people are begging and praying to God for has revealed that they are starting in the wrong place if they want to end up where God is calling them to be. We remind ourselves of the passage in Isaiah 58 and starting just at the first part and the last. Is this not the fast I choose to free the bonds of injustice, to undo the throngs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, bring the homeless poor into your houses, and when you see the naked to cover them and not hide yourselves from your own flesh and blood? The call is if, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then says the text, your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places, will make you strong and you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water who never fails. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt and you shall rise up the foundations of many generations and you will be called the repairers of the breach, the restorer of houses to live in. Now this comes as a very hard message because it was a prophetic message to a desperate, disillusioned generation. This was the generation of young leaders who had been taken away when Jerusalem was captured and the temple was destroyed. And they were taken away to captivity in Babylon. And they had kept faithful and they had prayed and worked as a generation to return to normal. And they had invested all their hope in faithful religious practice. And when they returned, they realized that their faith had had to do with their unfaithfulness to God. So every year they dedicated a day of repentance and fasting. And they put on sackcloth and they ripped their clothes and they covered their head with ashes and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed so that things would return to where they were. And the hard news comes in this text. They had hoped that through their faithfulness the temple would be rebuilt and that all would return to the times of blessing and growth and prosperity. But instead, they found themselves in chaos and crisis and that, the re and that things were getting worse and not better. They felt disappointed, defrauded, God did not seem to pay attention. The promised poster posterity that if they did everything they needed to do as faithful believers, and they sacrificed and worshiped God, all would be well. But that did not materialize. They did two things. They protested and complained. They felt they were living among the ruins of the previous generation, that they had not created this problem, that all as they had done is act faithfully. They had suffered. They had been faithful and zealous. They insisted on ritual and devotion. 
but the crisis continued to get worse and worse. Their problem was both theological and social. The theological problem was that it, they believed that God was either punishing them or ignoring them. That somehow they had been failing to do what God wanted them to do. On the other hand, they were desperate for only one thing, to return to a life of ease without social chaos. The prophet shared very, very, very good news. And at the same time, the prophet shared very, very, very bad news. The good news in the text is that if you do not attend to your own needs and you are not overly preoccupied with your own sense of repentance, but instead you care for the needs of the poor, the vulnerable, and the suffering, if you put your energy not on being pious, but on practicing justice, then indeed you will prosper, but not in the way you thought. You will not prosper as a small group who is blessed instead of the whole rest of the people who are not blessed, but you will prosper because you are called by God to help all prosper. You will have a bright future but not the future that you wanted. You will not be called the most faithful and pious generation. You will be called the repairers of the breach. Those who took what was broken and destroyed and rather than build a temple for your own devotion to God, you created houses for ordinary people to live in. You created the possibility of full life. God does the building, but God calls you to be co-builders. You are praying for prosperity. Instead, you are given a job, a task, a new name, a new vocation. It has been said, and you can tell me later if this is correct, that this generation of university students has been called the most unlucky generation in recent history. You will have already, before the pandemic, inherited an uncertain future caused by people of my generation and others. We already said it ecological destruction, crushing inequality, a world system that is frankly unjust and unfair, growing authoritarian governments around the world, wars, pandemic, rising nuclear tension. And we know that you are a generation that has struggled on hard paths for academic success, have sacrificed much to get into the university that you have want to, that it isn't easy, that much has gone into that moment when you finally graduate and you arrive and you can enjoy the benefits. Except with the pandemic and with social, con social chaos, that's not the case that what you were told if you just did everything correctly, things would work out, but many have found their hopes dashed. So you might be expecting a very exciting and vibrant campus life, but only to understand that it isn't going to be that way, that actually there is not a return to normal. And for many reasons, therefore, this generation of university and seminary students can feel cheated that what you have promised and worked very hard for has been denied. 
and that some of these opportunities won't come back. Disillusionment, disappointment, and even depression abound. A sense of living in the ruins. But you know what? This generation has also been called the most social, the most empowered, the most anxious generation. And what if it is possible that as the generation returned from exile, that this anxiety for the future is in fact a gift from God. This anxiety about what will be next and how to deal with the future been given is God's way of reminding us that return to normal is not what we are called to do. Because normal was not the world that God wanted. If you want to go to the world that God wants, you don't start from here, from an inward turning about our own needs, but you start from a very different place based on justice. Very bad news that we're off track as a generation. And very, very good news that if, and if, we put the needs of others forward, if we orientate our entire faith and religious life for the well-being of all people and the planet, then we will all prosper. God will guide us, accompany us, and be with us. Many, many bad theologies are circulating right now, telling us about how we are being punished and the pandemic is punishment for everything from gay marriage to other kinds of infidelity. These are far from scriptural truths. Instead, the gospel writer, uh, the prophet rather, tells us that we are being pointed to a fast that God calls us to, to put in first place justice for everyone. We do live in a scandalous world and the shattering population of squid games and other K-dramas. Anybody watch squid games? Yeah. It shows that the secret is out, that this is not an innocent generation, that everybody here in this room does know or can know that individualistic, competitive, capitalist society is brutal, violent, and deadly. It is among all things unfair and does not look like the world that God wanted, wants. So the message may be hard to hear that success does not come by playing the game. That the passage today reminds us the fast that we have been told to undertake is not what God wants us to do. We don't win the world that God wants by playing the game, we win it by refusing to play the game, to caring for all and everyone. And interestingly enough, Isaiah, this prophet, in pointing to God's call to justice as the center of our faiths, points directly to Jesus. In the passage of Luke 4, Jesus proclaims in Luke 4, 16, from the book of the prophet Isaiah itself, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to release all those who have been oppressed. We have an opportunity for a new name and a new vocation. A time to understand that we hear the bad news that we are on track and hear the very, very good news that if we feed...